Welcome to this Upgrade Your Sound product showcase. My name is Steven Selman um, with Music and Arts. Really excited to spend some time talking about P. Moriat saxophones tonight. Um, I've got a special guest joining us from the P. Moriat company, Mr. Craig Denny. Um, he's here to discuss a couple of the key models, share some insights into really what makes these saxophones unique, and of course, answer any questions that you have. Um, you can see the Q&A functionality down at the bottom of your screen. So at any point during the session, you can post a question. I'll be able to answer that for you, uh, or obviously I'll pose it uh, to Mr. Denny here. These saxophones are incredibly popular among students, teachers, and the gigging musician. And we're going to take a deep dive really on three particular models uh, and hear from the expert on why P. Moriat is, the, is a great choice for the advancing saxophone player looking to upgrade to a better instrument. Upgrading your horn obviously makes an incredible difference in the enjoyment of playing and really unlocks that true potential of what kind of musician that you can be. Um, so without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Craig uh, and he's gonna get us started and we'll be bouncing some questions back and forth. Um, again, feel free to drop any questions that you have there in the Q&A uh, functionality down at the bottom and we'll pose it to the expert. So uh, Craig, take it away. I appreciate it and I uh, appreciate the opportunity from Music and Arts to uh, come and talk a little bit about P. Morant saxophones. Uh, you know, before I get into the, the company and the horns, uh, to tell you a little bit about myself, uh, I am a musician first and foremost and uh, played professionally in Chicago for uh, about a decade before I got into the other side of the business and actually worked uh, my way up through uh, uh, Con Selmer and eventually was the uh, director of marketing for saxophones for them. So I've got experience with a wide range of different saxophones and uh, about 10 years ago, I was offered the opportunity to run P. Moriat in North America. And so that's kind of where we are. Uh, so, <clears throat> you know, a little bit about P. Moriat. It's a really interesting company because it's a young company. It was founded in 2003 and it's, uh, it's a, that's a very non-traditional start for company, uh, you know, to be doing the kind of things that, that we've been able to do. It's, and it's been a lot of fun. So uh, P, the P actually stands for Paul. It's uh, Paul Moriat was a band leader, a French band leader in the 60s and 70s. He had a kind of a hit. Uh, it was uh, Love is Blue. Uh, if you'll check it out, you'll, uh, you'll, you know, you'll find it. And um, the reason the brand is called P. Moriat is because because the, uh, the gentleman who owns the company and runs the company out of Taiwan, uh, his name is Alex, he loves P Paul Moran's music and approached the, uh, the family and, and the Paul rights to, to, to use the name. And so that's, that's where we are. So uh, P. Moriat is based in Taiwan. It's an all uh, it's a Taiwanese company that makes um, instruments in saxophones, clarinets, uh, flutes, and trumpets. They only make professional and intermediate uh, instruments. They don't make any student instruments. So they uh, they believe in, uh, you know, we believe that, uh, you know, working from the top down and integrating vertically all the way down through the line is really important because all of the features that sit in a, you know, in a top level instrument, they still have, the, the basics still have to be there at the very bottom too. So no matter what instrument you're playing, what saxophone you're playing, you're getting a base level of quality and consistency that is, uh, you know, essential. I mean, you have to have it to be playing a, a better instrument. So, um, you know, it's uh, the tagline for P. Moriat <clears throat> is an interesting one. It's it's kind of uh, kind of dopey. Uh, it's go for the sound. And when I first heard it, I was like, oh, that's terrible. And as I started to live with it a little bit longer, I was like, actually, it's not terrible. It's kind of exactly who we are. Uh, you know, go for the sound is, is the tag, but it really encompasses what P. Moriata is. We're a sound-focused company. Uh, and not just, you know, what sound we get out of this horn or we get out of a trumpet or a clarinet or, or a flute. It's 
the sound that you make is the sound that the player makes. You know, our horns are designed uh, to get out of the way of the player, to make the experience as natural for our player as possible, to give them as much feedback, to give them as much um, what I call fun factor in what they do, so that they can just make have fun making music. And that translates, you know, from the top level pros that we have all the way down to somebody who's, you know, been playing for a year or two and, and needs to upgrade a little bit. I love it, man. You know, um, it's interesting. It's an interesting history for the company, but, you know, I've, I've been in this business 15 years. I'll never forget um, standing in uh, Illinois, Tasca, Illinois, with you at one of our Horns of Plenty shows. And uh, it's the first time we had met and, you know, I really started to hear about P. Moriot. The reason that you were there is we had a lot of customers that were coming in and asking about the, you know, the finishes. And, um, you know, it was really something that came at, to, at least to me out of nowhere. So, you know, from your perspective, when and how did these instruments really get that, that kind of attention and why? Like, sure. you know, all of a sudden, you know, it was um you know that you had your industry standards and then all of a sudden we've got these crazy finishes and some really incredibly sounding horns like when did that happen how did that kind of materialize and you know uh, what caused all that attention well i'll be honest i first heard about moria pretty early on it was about 2006 2007 uh i was with con selmer and you know, as I was talking to my, I was still playing full time in Chicago too. And so I was hearing a little bit of buzz about this new brand and with all new brands, you kind of you see the flavor of the month and there's like, there's this, this quick, Hey, this is really cool. And then it goes away. The thing with Moriat was it wasn't going away. It was two or three years of this. These are really cool. So uh, one of the things that we do on this side of the business is competitive analysis. And so we look at everybody's stuff and I, I got instruments on loan from all the big manufacturers and put more out into the mix just to see how it performed. And other than one other brand, it's on the way we scored it. It was the highest scoring, you know, horn that we played other than one. And, you know, for a new brand to have done that and, to capture the imagination of the people that were playing them. Cause I wasn't a part of it. I was administering it, but it was other people that were playing and looking at them. It was pretty amazing. And so when I had an opportunity to come in and run the brand, um, you know, I knew it was going to change this distributor's hands and that's, you know, doesn't, that's not really germane to the story, but I was like, I want a shot at this because this brand's got, you know, a lot going for it. And the horns have a lot going for them. That's, and I think that's really why, um, that's really why they, they, they got so much buzz early on. And it, you know, honestly, it's been sustained throughout the, throughout the last 10 years. I love it. It's a great story, man. Really great story. So, you know, in our audience, we have educators, we have um, students that have not upgraded their instrument and are trying to look for some guidance on what to get, why we'll get into some of that here in just a little bit. Um, but I guess my next um, question is, is, you know, I wanna give you a little bit of time to talk through some of the models. So, you know, we're gonna talk about three models tonight. Um, you know, in my experience in selecting instruments, I've helped families select um, thousands of instruments in my career. And, you know, it seems to me that um, sometimes it becomes a belabored or an overly complicated process. And so, you know, yes. we, we've kind of selected the, the three models that we're going to talk about that you want to highlight, um, and then I'll bounce some other questions off of you. But, you know, just quick overview, just a couple of minutes on each horn, and, uh, and sure. we'll talk about some of the differences and some of the other things that make those uh, instruments unique. Yeah, so what I have in my hand first is, uh, you know, we, we, we picked horns that, uh, that obviously we feel super confident in. But we also picked horns that, um, you know, when I do a step up event, particularly, you know, an upgrade your sound, it's like, I know, I, I, you know, once we talk a little bit when, you know, when I talk with that parent and I'm a parent, I've got three kids, all of whom who play a musical instrument. And when I talk with that parent and I, you know, then get 
and, and talk with um, their their son or daughter, you know, I can get them into one of three. And you know, the first the first one that I have in my hands is the PMXA sixty seven RDK. Um, it's a it's the pro. It's our most popular professional alto. Uh, its counterpart is the sixty six RDK tenor, which is our most pro, you know popular professional tenor. You can tell it's uh, it's got a little bit different finish, and that's by design. It's not we didn't just go oh hey that looks really cool. We try to keep our finishes on the sonically viable side, meaning they add something or they do something to the instrument that's really, uh, it, it'll set it apart from the other horns that may have a different finish, but it's the same horn. So this is the, uh, the 67 uh, RDK. It's what we call a dark finish instrument. It means it actually has, it does have lacquer on it, but it's designed to look almost antique. And uh, the antiquing, is an aesthetic thing. It just means that there's a little bit more that's put into the finish, and then it's got a matte lacquer over it, so it's completely protected, uh, and which is really important for like a 13 to 18 year old kid because they've got enough, uh, you know, hormones running through them to power New York City. What that translates to is oils in the hands, and oils break down lacquer, which is essentially just paint. So this is still lacquered. It's still completely protected. Um, the, the biggest thing about a 67R, though, is uh, the R stands for roll. The tone holes on a 67R or a 66R are drawn and rolled. And that's very different than what happens on any other saxophone in it from any other maker or even any other horn in our line. Most are drawn out of the body tube, so there's like something that comes in it, it pulls the, the tone hole out, and when I say tone hole, I mean like that, that's a tone hole, okay? So it pulls the tone hole out, and then there's like a thing that cuts it off. That's a straight tone hole. Well, on a roll tone hole, which is a very old traditional way of doing it, they actually roll the top of the tone hole over. There's a little thing that comes, it, it almost makes it look like a mushroom cap. But what it does is it takes all the resistance out of a horn and makes it super fun to play. So instead of a tone hole being just straight up and down, that tone hole then goes like this. So it's just, it's a very little thing. But when you have that happen from the top of the body tube all the way through the bow and through the bell, and you have all of these tone holes are all now drawn and rolled, it creates this thing that's totally different. So if you had a straight tone hole on this, like all the way through this horn, it would feel very different. The resistance would feel very different to a, a player, especially a younger player. And so for the same amount of air, they're getting more bang for their buck out of a, of a, a 67R. And it makes it a very flexible instrument too. Yeah, so, that's 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 kind of the signature, right? I mean, that's yeah. that's one of the that's the one of the hallmarks, at least for P. Moriat, and it's what I hear a lot about. Um, yeah. Sure. So, um, you know, one thing I want to say before we get into my next question uh, on this horn particularly is this, is a, whenever you described it and probably how I would describe it, you hear the word professional, right? Mm -hmm. or the, that sure. term. And, you know, I think that for someone who doesn't actually play the instrument or, or uh, doesn't know what exactly they're looking at, doesn't mean that you have to be a professional saxophone player to buy that instrument. Correct. I mean, it is absolutely a horn for the amateur player who yeah. uh, wants really good equipment in their hands to play. Uh, but it's also obviously for that for that player that uh, wants to upgrade from their student level instrument or intermediate level instrument. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. But, you know, I felt like that was important to to uh, to point out there. Ro roll tone holes definitely something that separates P Moriat from a lot of other uh, brands. I hear a lot about that from customers. Um, the, the question on the back end of this is, you know, I, I see a lot of different finishes. I've seen the, you know, the smoky black. I've seen right. clear lacquer. I've seen unlacquered. I've seen dark black. I've seen, you know, all of the above. Can you, does it make any difference to the sound? Like, is that something that actually impacts what's coming out of the bell of the instrument? Or is it just for looks and to be cool? Like, can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. So 
uh, it really depends on the amount of finishing that happens. So like this horn, actually it has, it's, it's a raw brass instrument. Then there's, to get sort of like the, the darker tones in it, it actually has to have black lacquer that's applied to it and then it's kind of rubbed off. And then there's a coat of matte lacquer that's put onto it. So like if you took this horn but you had a cognac lacquer version or a gold lacquer version, it's still got lacquer on it. It will play different because it's got less finishing on it. And so it, it, some people think it's psychoacoustics. I'm a big believer that um, the type of finish that you put on the instrument does make a difference in the way it sounds. And the reason is this, ver this horn in raw brass will respond totally different than this horn in a lacquer of any kind. And it just depends what? on the pigment because pigment weighs, you know, like the cognac lacquer weighs and it's by a very little amounts, but it weighs more than a gold lacquer does. It's got different pigments in it. Yeah, and that absolutely matters as a trumpet player and man, trumpet players love to hear themselves talk. So I'll make it quick, but uh, <laughs> you know, the, the lead pipe, I mean, you know, we're talking uh, one hundredths uh, of an inch difference in lead pipe and, and how they uh, how they make that and just that little bit actually makes a, a really big difference. It's a really good point. Um, so from the la from the finishes perspective, is there one that sounds you know that's suited for jazz or suited for classical playing? You know more than the other, or you know, uh, and then the second piece of that is. What's the most popular? What do you see um, going out the door the most uh, in the sure. different finishes? Sure. So traditionally, classical, like really, uh, I, I, I'll say it, really stuffy classical professors at the collegiate level will often prefer a gold lacquered instrument to anything else. Uh, but the finish is not indicative of what should be played on that horn. This instrument could sound absolutely beautiful in a classical setting. It could sound absolutely slamming in, in a jazz setting. That's more dependent on what mouthpiece you play on, the read, the type of reeds you play, and the way you play it. I'm a classically trained clarinetist, but all of my training on saxophone is in jazz and pop and commercial playing. So. No one's asking me to play a bunch of classical music on a saxophone, but they, they do ask me to play jazz. And so when I play, it's the setup is really what makes that big difference. Uh, it's n much less about the lacquer. So what was the second one part of the question? I yeah, no, the most, uh, that's all right, man. So the most, you know, what do you see going out the door the most? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, what, so, do you, what do you see? Yeah, so, so for Moriat in particular, the dark finish instruments, um, so, the DK instruments are, regardless of whether it's a 67 or a System 76, those are the most popular finishes. Um, they're just, it's just a good combination of aesthetic look and the horn still really performs. Uh, amongst our artists, it's mostly raw brass. And it's because of the amount of fun factor you get in a raw brass instrument. There's just more signal back to the player in a raw brass instrument. Uh, you know, gold lacquer actually kind of brings up the rear for us. Uh, cognac lacquer is the second most popular. It goes dark finish, cognac lacquer, raw brass, uh, gold lacquer, which in some of the other uh, tradition, more traditional brands, they only have either clear lacquer or gold lacquer. So, and, and they might have some other finishes, but they don't really, it's not their, their go-to. So you'll find, you know, in some other brands, it's definitely just gold lacquer and that's it. Yeah, love it. And, you know, um, again, back in the spirit of not overcomplicating this situation, music and art stores has uh, many of these horns on the wall. And if we don't have it in the wall in your local store, uh, we absolutely can get it. So um, we'll, we'll help through that process. So we've talked a little bit about the professional level instrument. Yeah. Uh, Obviously, it's a little bit more expensive, so there is a step down from there. Yeah. Um, you mind talking a little bit about those horns, the other two horns that you have, and, sure. and uh, you know what 
are really the key differences? What should a, a parent be concerned with and what should the, um, you know, the, the musician that's wanting to upgrade be concerned with? Sure. So, you know, what you said actually about professional instruments is really important. Um, just because it says professional on it does not mean that it's only played by professionals. Anyone who aspires to play better can play a pro horn. That's, it's, you know, when we design these, it's not with the, like, it's not with the symphony musician in mind. It's with the player who wants to do as much as they want to do on the instrument. That's how we do it. So there, you know, even though the 67 hours of pro horn, and we technically don't call the, this is the Labravo 200A. We technically don't call this a pro horn, but it's based on the same exact body, body tube as the 67. It just has straight tone holes and it's uh, put together a little different. Instead of all yellow brass construction on the 67, this actually has 80-20 bronze brass. And all that means is it's got a little bit more copper in the brass than 70-30 yellow brass. That's all it is. It's the, it's the ratio of copper to zinc, if you really want to nerd out. So this is actually made out of bronze brass. It's a little bit warmer in tone color because of the bronze brass. And to counteract that, we actually use a nickel silver neck. And nickel silver's just like super zippy and it got a really positive signal right away. It helps to counteract how warm the, brass, the, the bronze brass is. And then we use regular yellow brass keys for strength and durability. And this horn, you know, comes in, clocks in at a little bit, well, actually a bit under where a 67R does. And it's a tremendous value because it's nearly all the same features, minus road tone holes. Um, <clears throat> but you get different features. It's a different feature set. At this price point, most everything else is yellow brass. This gives you a little bit more uh, color in the sound, a little bit more warmth, but it still gives you punch. And that's... I mean, for a developing player, so like 13 to 16 years old, 12 to 14 years old, this is a perfect horn because it's, I, what, I, what I say about it often is it's, uh, it's almost like, you know, when you first bowl, you go bowling, you know, you put the bumpers in, you kind of got guardrail, you got, you got the bumpers. This I've pulled all my really life and I still have bumpers in the uh, thing. Exactly. <laughs> well, it's, you're a trumpet player, it's okay. <laughs> right. So instead of having this wide open, really like um, the ability to do a ton of things with your embouchure on a 67, this kind of reigns you in a little bit. But that's really good for a developing player because it teaches a, a young, younger player how to play the instrument properly so that you can then expand your horizons with the pro horn. So that's, and you know, that's kind of, really the design concept behind a, two, a Labravo 200A. Um, it, this, this horn fights with the 67 RDK every year for top spot in our line in terms of the number of, of, of uh, altos that we sell. I mean, it's, you know, and it dwarfs, every, like those two dwarf everything else in that intermediate and then professional line. So I love it's, it. Yeah. <clears throat> For the for the beginner saxophone who you know uh, rented an instrument or got a student level instrument, it's a pretty significant jump from yeah. that horn to that. And from a price point perspective, it's perfect for um, you know the musicians that really figured out what they want to do for the rest of their musical career, mm -hmm. uh, growing into uh, just loving the instrument, just need something better to play. It's a fantastic choice. Uh, love that instrument. Yeah, uh, what you have there. So this is the this is actually exclusive to music and arts, and this is called the 57 GC, the PMSA 57 GC. Now here's the thing: this is when I said in, earlier in the you know uh, in the stream, I said talked about vertical integration. That's just a fancy marketing term for it. We use a lot of the same things from top to bottom. So this this horn is actually made in the same body tube as the 67R and the Labravo. But it's a little bit, it's, it's not stripped down. It's just we've taken the things that add a little bit more cost into those other instruments. We've taken them off this instrument. But the signal that you get from this body tube is 
is nearly the same. The only thing that this 67 has that this doesn't is the roll tone hole. It's done in gold lacquer. It's still actually got um, tiger's eye pearls. These are synthetic. The abalone on the 67 is, is you know, genuine, ethically sourced, obviously. But this, you know, this horn, they, they all have the same super six neck. Um, they, they all respond phenomenally well. And actually, I played through all three. I, the 67 was my favorite because of the, the way, you know, these aren't mine. These are what I got out of, out of the, you know, of our warehouse. But, uh, you know, the 67 was my, my favorite out of how, like, how much it could do. But I'll be honest, this 50, the 57 G was my second favorite of the three of these instruments because it just, it rang. It had so much vibrance and it had so much presence to it. And it was like right there um, in terms of sound. It was really cool to play. And it was, you know, it was, it's always a nice surprise because typically what happens is, you know, you get the pro horn and that obviously it's going to play really well. And then the intermediate plays, it still plays pretty well. And then you get to the entry level intermediate. It's like, I don't know. This didn't do that. This really played really well. Um, this is perfect for you know, the student who has rented for a year or two, who loves playing, who's not ready, you know, they or their parents are not ready to make that pro commitment yet, but they're looking for something that's like markedly better than what they're playing. This is a perfect instrument for it. And the 57s all come, whether you get it in the regular package, the jazz package or the classical package, they all come with a complete upgraded accessory pack. So, We've and I've curated an accessory pack for each of those packages that focuses in on better equipment um, to accompany the saxophone too, and that's super important. I can't stress this enough. When you go to find your next instrument, make sure to have upgraded your mouthpiece already. Do that first. Do that like six months. If you know if if your student. You know, if your your son or daughter loves to play, the best thing you can get them is a better mouthpiece. Get them on good reads, a better mouthpiece, and a better ligature as fast as possible. Because that sets them up for success. And that sets them up for all, playing all of these instruments. Yeah, the better the, I think the saying goes, the better the equipment closer to the source of the sound um, is always going to give you the desired result. Without uh, question. With with practice, of course. Yeah. Um, so a couple other things, you know, we've talked about some really great horns. Again, it's not an overly complicated um, process to select an instrument. I mean, it's, you know, you, you certainly don't want the equipment that your child or, you know, even that you're, you yourself are playing to hold you back. Um, you know, it's like driving a Ford Focus versus a Ferrari. I mean, right. it literally is uh, that kind of difference. So, couple of the things that I want to talk about. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I have some friends that play P. Moriat. Um, you know, since they came onto the scene, you know, I think you said 2006 is when they really started to, to ramp up. But, um, you know, I, I've got some friends that play, absolutely love the horns. I, I know a few that play, play the soprano. Um, uh, I've got a friend that owns one of the berries. But, um, you know, it's a, these are really, really versatile horns. Mm -hmm. um, can you speak to that a little bit? Like, you, you know, I, as a trumpet player myself, um, I uh, really specialize in classical playing, sure. um, you know, church gigs and church services and weddings and things like that. But there's times where I get called in for a big band gig or, um, you know, go sit in uh, and play some charts at a bar or something. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, can you speak a little bit to that? And, it, you know, are, are these horns something that you can do that with or, or are they good for both? They're, yes, and what they're very specific to not the different types of things that you can play because, you know, as I said earlier, that is more dependent on mouthpiece. That's, you know, the difference between, you know, a Van Dorn AL3 and like I play a Meyer, and granted, it's sort of a vintage Meyer, but, you know, those are very different mouthpieces and they will give you a very different. 
but you can get a classical sound on a Moriat, and you can get a jazz sound, and you can get a pop sound. The the thing that's really important to know about Moriats is all of those those genres have a modern version of their sound, and so class you know whether it's classically or jazz playing or pop playing, there's a modern sound that has emerged uh, in especially in in the U.S. and Moriats are designed for that. It's not only to give, you know, like a 67R, a lot of people will say, hey, that, to me, that plays like a vintage whatever. And, and it actually is like a vintage, uh, almost a Cowworth or a Cuff. Those all had rolled, or a Con. And those all had rolled, drawn and rolled tone effects. And that's why it gets its comp, you know, that's why it gets its comp. But it has a modern twist on that big, bold, and so whether, no matter what it is, whether it's the LaBravo or a 57 GT, they all have a modern version. You know, they, they're very flexible horns, but they all have a modern saxophone concept or sound concept behind them. So, yes, I mean, that's, you know, that's by design. It's not, we didn't, again, we didn't just happen across and go, oh, that's cool. <laughs> so we actually designed that into the horn. Yeah, I love it. Well, they're great instruments, man. Um, appreciate you talking about them. So um, the case is behind you. So obviously, sure. this is a critical component of the package, right? You got to protect that investment, protect that instrument. Um, I personally know a lot about those cases, but I know our audience probably doesn't know a lot. Sure. Um, and then obviously, too, you know, the uh, the high school student, the ones that are, that are upgrading and, and moving through their career, the cool factor is also a piece. This, right so absolutely very cool yeah so all of our pearl horns uh come in what we call the soft contoured case it's not soft the the, the, the cordura is soft to the touch but it's uh it's a um, synthetic shell case it's super light it's incredibly sturdy and you know the more cases uh they do not skimp on pockets um i you know i've done some product videos where I will actually like one of the, you know, I said uh, in one of them, I'm like, it's got an obscene amount of pockets. Like it's not, you know, socially acceptable how many pockets this thing has. Cause it does, it's got, you know, it's got a pocket for, uh, you know, here for all your stuff. It's got uh, for your phone. It's got on the backside uh, for your uh, iPad or, you know, um, and I mean, in, on the inside of the case, it's actually got a compartment underneath it so for all extra stuff, I mean, and that's, you know, still being a shaped case, they typically don't have a lot. Uh, shaped cases don't always have a ton of pockets. This one does. Um, and, you know, it's great to carry everything. It's got, uh, you know, it's backpackable. Uh, it's got a shoulder strap. And uh, it, you know, it, it does what it's supposed to do first and foremost, which is it protects the horn. Yeah, that's pri priority number one. That is fair. So um, what else comes in it? Does it come with a mouthpiece? You mentioned talking mouthpieces and, and upgrading that mouthpiece, but you know what does, what does it come with? Any recommendations for those listening? Sure. So Moriots all come with a standard P Moriot mouthpiece. It's good. Uh, sorry, my dogs are it's okay. uh, enjoying life too. Uh, they all come with a mouthpiece. They all come with a, uh, a ligature and a P. Moriat reed. Um, you know, every Moriat comes as a full outfit. You could, with meaning, you could play that right out of with what's in the case. You could play it right out of its box. Um, you know, once you get to this level, you should probably be playing on something different uh, in terms of a mouthpiece ligature. Although the P. Moriat reeds are phenomenal. They're really good, uh, but like. You know, uh, I mentioned them before, a Van Doren AL3 or a Selmer Sea Star is a perfect concert band mouthpiece to be playing all sorts of different things. Once you get into jazz bands, you know, Myers, uh, if it's a tenor, an auto link, something like that. Um, like it, and it, you know, we could do an entire 40 minutes on just that stuff. I And I could nerd out really hard and I'd make somebody mad with who I didn't mention. So... Well, I won't do that, but what's important is once, you know, once your student or once you are 
you know, you're set. You're like, ah, I, I love playing. I want to get better at this. It's really important to get on a better, set, you know, better reads, a better ligature, and most importantly, a better mouthpiece. Sure. Yeah. And there, you know, there are a couple of standards out there. Again, not to overcomplicate it, our, our stores at Music and Arts, find your local Music and Arts store. Many of our uh, team members um, have education degrees or performance degrees, or they're all players. Um, and you usually can find a, a saxophone player in one of our stores that could help guide or at least a woodwind player to say, hey, these are the, these are the basics. Um, and then secondarily to that, um, you know, hopefully your beginning musician or your advancing musician is taking lessons, even the, um, the folks out there that are not in grade school or taking music lessons and their educator can help advise on that front from a, you know, what do they prefer from a mouthpiece perspective, depending on what you're playing. Uh, saxophone players I know all own, you know, a bucket full of mouthpieces, metal yeah. and rubber, hard rubber, yeah. and all of the above. So uh, that's good stuff. Are there any other upgraded accessories that you'd recommend? You know, I know that um, moisture is a big deal in, mm -hmm. in woodwind instruments, but anything other than that um, that you think would be beneficial for the group? Well, definitely a reed holder of some kind. It's super important to rotate your reeds, which means... You know, this reed that I'm playing, you know, I've got on my mouthpiece right now. I'm not playing that reed tomorrow. That's going back in my reed holder, and it's not going to get played tomorrow. I'm going to play the reed that is next in line. Rotating three to four, or if you're playing seriously, you know, six to ten reeds on a, every instrument you play is super important. And that's not just a ploy. Look, like, it's not a ploy to get you to buy more reeds. What that does is it allows the reeds to settle back down. It's a natural fiber. So especially in cane reeds, it settles it back down. It gets you, it allows that reed to settle back down into a regular humidity, which allows it to last longer. It's really to get your reeds to last longer. If you just play this reed until it literally just will walk off your mouthpiece by itself, it's not going to last very long. It, it will not. So rotating your reeds is super important. Reed, and reed cases are, are uh, essential to that. The other thing I would say is uh, neck strap. Um, especially for uh, younger players, it's important to get a strap that is uh, that helps um, promote good posture. There's a lot of different neck straps out there to that do that. Moriats all come with um, a P. Moriant neck strap, which is actually really good. It's got the leather, uh, padded leather uh, top to it. It slides very easily. It's a really great, uh, really great neck strap. I actually, this is the strap that I use. Um, if I use a harness, I use something called the sax holder. And that uh, is a super cool, like space age holder, but it takes all the weight off your neck. And especially if you've got any back problems or you're playing a tenor and you're, um, you know, you're a younger musician and you're playing tenor, or especially Barry, sax holder is essential. It, it'll change your life. It's really great. Yeah, so, I love yeah. it, man. It's that gear. Well, yeah. you can find it at Music and Arts. Um, and Craig, I can't thank you enough, man, for coming on. Um, at, you know, really great horns, very popular um, among educators, students, private teachers, professionals, all of the above, and, um, you know, a really great line of instruments, not just in alto horns, but we've got sopranos, tenors, and, and berries, so. Yeah, the line, the line does go through Safranino, through berries, actually bass sax even, uh, so, yeah. Wow. It's, uh, it's, it's a full line, for sure. Yep, I love it. Well, we uh, can't thank you enough for being here, really appreciate it. Um, couple of things I just wanted to touch on before we let everybody go for the evening. So, you know, again, I can't thank you enough for being here. Um, uh, I think everybody would agree that these horns are, are among the top instruments in the marketplace today. Uh, excellent choice for, for really every level of player. Um, during Upgrade Your Sound, during this uh, Upgrade Your Sound showcase, we have uh, a couple of special offers that I wanted to, to leave you with. So first of all, you know, right here at the holidays, uh, we offer 48 month financing. And so, you know, to get that professional level saxophone, um, you know, that certainly could help the situation. 
Uh, it's the first time that we've ever been able to offer 48 month financing. Um, you can get that special financing at any music and art store, or we also offer that um, online at financing online with our partner Woodwind and Brasswind. Um, after this is over, you will receive an email with the details for that, or you can just go directly to woodwindbrasswind.com. Um, and then uh, you, you may choose that financing or we have just a outright purchase option, a cash, uh, a cash deal. Uh, it's 15% off anything 199 or more that runs from now through Christmas. So, um, so you're good there. And again, you know, most of our store stock these horns uh, as well as many others. So um, if you got any uh, other questions, this showcase actually extends to in store this weekend. Uh, visit local music and art store, speak with an instrument expert. Um, there you can learn more about these horns. Um, and, you know, one thing that I'll plug uh, selfishly before we get out of here, you know, music lessons, uh, private music instruction, music, music education, whatever you want to call it, is one of the single most important things that you can do in addition to upgrading your horn. Um, you know, I started playing uh, in the fifth grade, like many others, and, you know, a year and a half, two years in, my parents uh, ponied up and um, we found a private trumpet teacher. And from that point on, it, it really changed the outlook on um, how much I cared about what I was doing. Um, it kept me from getting frustrated. It's something that uh, is absolutely a critical part to this. If this is something that they've got a passion for, or that you have a passion for, um, it, you can't replace music instruction and the joy that you can get out of it. So um, again, Craig, we appreciate you being here. Thanks to P. Moriart. And uh, we'll see you all um, very soon. Thank you and have a great evening.